we've been talking about some leadership lessons that we learned from the life and the ministry of Paul. And so first and foremost, we said in 1 Corinthians 14, 18, that Paul said, I pray in tongues more than you all. And so we want you to be mindful of that. We want you to be sure that you're aware of how you're spending that time as you surrender to and give yourself to praying in the Holy Spirit. Last week, we spent a little bit of time um, as, as, as Jesus would instruct his disciples when he sent them out in Mark chapter six, verses one through 11. He said, if you go into a community and you're not received, shake the dust off of your feet and, and, and leave that as a testimony for those who did not receive. And so what I wanna encourage you to do every time we receive the word of God, we wanna pray over it. We wanna ask the Holy Spirit. We don't wanna intellectualize it within our own understanding and say, well, that means I should do this and I should do that. No, just gain the knowledge and then say, Holy Spirit, I trust that you're gonna help me I receive that in such a way that I can appropriate that. So if there's any relationships in my life that I've kept myself, remember we said, I believe it is in the Amplified Bible, um, the Amplified Classic, that, that when it said, shake off the dust, that that's breaking all ties. And so Holy Spirit, if there's anybody that I'm tied to, anybody that I've taken on, so to speak, that I'm carrying on my back in my perspective, um, if, if there's anybody that, that I need to break ties with, I'll ask you to show me who that is or, or who those people are and I'll be quick to do that because more than anything else, it will distract you from the potential and the promise of all that God has for you as you move into your future. And so we spent a little bit of time talking about that. In 1 Corinthians 11 verse one, um, Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. And so as we look at some of these examples in Paul, and obviously we've been looking at the Lord Jesus as well, the goal would be not only that we would gain insight from the word, but then we would also, um, it be said of us that people could follow us as we follow Christ. And so it's important, we'll look at this in 1 John chapter 5, verse four. Our perspective is so, so, so important as leaders, as influencers. And remember we've said the most important person you lead is yourself because you can only really control you. You have limited control over your children, depending on their age and that, but, but 100% of the time, the only person that you can control is you. So the most important person you lead is yourself. So our perspective is really important. And if you wanna take down that definition of the word control, the only person that you can really control is you. That means to direct, to regulate, to hold in restraint, or to check. So to control is to direct, to regulate, to hold in restraint or check. And so let's look at this before we get into number two today. Number one, obviously I speak in tongues more than you all. First John chapter five, verse four says, for whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. You know, it's important that we look to the word of God for success. You know, there's a lot of things that you can do, um, you know, as parents, as business owners, especially as it relates to the place of influence with which God has set you in, um, you know, in, in growing and understanding your position and these things naturally. But it's the word of God that provides us victory. And Romans 10, 17 says that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So if faith comes by hearing the word of God and faith is our victory, what would be more important than that? What would be more important than knowing the word of God? What would be more important in growing in the word of God? Your victory is tied to your hunger. Your victory is tied to your hunger, which means depending on how you wanna win, you have a lot at stake. And so it's really important that we establish such value in the times that God has graced us and allowed us to come together, that we would never take those times for granted, that we would never see those as, as some sort of an obligation or some sort of a routine, that, that every time we open up the word of God, that that's a once in a lifetime experience 
that there's never another jump start. There's never, never another service like the present one. You, you go to some places and, 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 and if it's frozen food that comes in a package, it's extremely consistent. It's the same every single time. If you go somewhere else, uh, well, their goal is to, for it to be the same every single time. Think about the, the amazing love in our Father that it's not the same every single time. That he, he has you dialed in and as a family comes together, a church body comes together in one mind, in one accord, like surrendered, like you are God and we are not. There is such a grace there. There's such a supply there in and through our hunger where needs will be met supernaturally. This is such a precious thing. This is such a holy thing. Remember when God spoke to Moses and, and uh, at the burning bush and he was beginning to give him instruction? And every time we come to church, we need to recognize that that's one of the objectives would be that we would receive divine instruction for our lives. That we, want, we would not continue just to call our own shots and do what we think is best. And so as God's giving Moses divine instruction, he told him to take off his sandals for you're standing on holy ground. And Pastor Dean talked about this a little bit on Wednesday, but then even in our PFS, like this is not a casual thing. Now, if you're casual, it will never be life-changing to you. Whether it is or isn't is not on the basis of your response. It is not casual. But if, if you don't recognize the holiness about this, and the enemy loves to diminish that in our minds and in our perspectives, he loves for us to, to feel um, as though we were martyrs in this whole pursuit of our Father, that we did God some sort of service by getting up today by showing up today, by coming today, preparing to serve, even maybe serving all three services, that we've really done a big thing. No, this is a holy thing, that we would be even invited to participate in kingdom eternal matters. That the God who created the heavens and the earth knows your name Sometimes you just have to slap yourself and say, who do you think you are? Who do you think you are? What are you doing? What are you doing with your life? And what are you thinking about? And why are you so selfish? Do you know what I mean? This is a holy, precious thing with which we've been entrusted. And that even the smallest thing that we get to do in his name, that he would trust us. Are, are you ever just so, I'm so just aware of my own dirt. That had he not breathed the breath of life into Adam, we are nothing. We, what are we going to do? What do we have? Nothing. We're nothing without him. And so the very least that we could do is, is just with such joy. And such delight, if you have children, you know what joy it is when you ask them to do something and they say, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am. And they hustle about it. As opposed to maybe the ones that are like, yeah, okay. And they walk so slow. It's like, bro, it's, it's tomorrow already. Like it's three days from now. What happened? It took you like three hours to do that, Right? as it relates to the assignments, the things that he's asked us to do, which for all of us are outlined in his word, that we would be prompt, that we would be excited, that we would jump at the chance to do it, that we would, we would allow ourselves to be directed and moved by his voice. What an honor that the very God of the universe speaks to us and helps us with our little problems, that shows us things to come that there's not a situation in our life that he would not be mindful of and he would not have made a supply for. Gosh, this is so important. Our perspective, humbling ourselves under the mighty hand of God. If we don't do that, if we don't control our own flesh, how in the world can we point others in the right direction? So there's an order about these things as it relates to us. 
And so in um, 1 Corinthians 9, this would be number two. Paul said it this way, verses 24 through 27. It's, it's familiar to you. I keep my body under. I keep my body under. Verse 24, know you not. That's number two. I keep my body under. Verse 24, 1 Corinthians 9. Know you not that they which run in a race all run, but only one receives a prize. So run that you may obtain. See, this kicks socialism right in the rear. And as it relates to our relationship with God, he loves us all the same, but we are not all rewarded the same. We don't all access kingdom promises in the same way. Even though they're available to all of us, there are many believers who are healed and there are others who never walk in the manifestation of their healing. You guys know this. There are some believers who are prospered, who experience God's abundant provision in their lives. And then there are other believers who do not and they struggle in their finances. And so ultimately um, we're winning or losing as the ball's in our court. It's not in his court. And every man that strives for the mastery, verse 25, is temperate. This word temperate means masterful. It means controlled. And every man that strives for mastery is temperate or masterful, proficient in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. And this, this again, this goes back to what I already said, like this is eternal business. What would be more important than this? Verse 26, I therefore run, not as uncertainly, so I fight, not as one that beats the air, like shadow boxing, not really moving, but not getting anything done. But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 33, the Bible says that God does all things decently and in order. Now, obviously we're three part being and the worldview puts things in order in a certain way and we must not surrender to their way. And so in many cases, it can be mind, Bo uh, excuse me, body, mind, and, and really their understanding and comprehension of spiritual matters really doesn't exist. Or they can invert these top two and they can be mind heavy, mind number one, then body, and again, this understanding of spirit is somewhat limited. What does that mean? That means what my body says is first and foremost or how my body looks, what I'm eating, what I'm doing. Pastor Dean talked about this on Wednesday night. You know, there's some people that never appropriate all the promises of God, not for failed nutrition, okay? So they're body conscious. They're aware of these external things. Maybe they're mind conscious, um, um, uh, uh, you're thinking, you're feeling, and you're choosing, not really, spirit conscience, or maybe they're, they're highly intellectual, um, your mind, your will, and your emotions, your body, not really spirit. We can't operate this way. We're spirit, soul, and body. Meaning we're first and foremost, a spirit. That's our, that's our order, which means spirit comes first. This is in our pursuits. We're spirit, soul. This is how God speaks to us. This is his order. First Thessalonians 5.23 says that I pray that you would be blameless in your whole spirit, soul, and body. This is the order. Spirit things come first. Spirit things come first. Say that after me. Spirit things come first. We have to be in order. In first, um, Thess uh, first Thessalonians 5.23, I gave you that. Proverbs 18. Look at this in the Amplified Classic. This is Proverbs 18. 14 and 15. It says the strong spirit of a man sustains him in bodily pain or trouble, but a weak and broken spirit, who can raise it up and bear? The strong spirit of a man sustains him. If I'm not sustained, if I'm weak in, bottle, in bodily pain and trouble, I've not been pursuing the right order because a strong spirit of a man will sustain that man 
in bodily trouble and pain. Spirit things come first. Say it again. Spirit things come first. In Proverbs 24, 10, this is the Amplified Classic too. It says, if you faint in the day of adversity, your strength is small. If you faint in the day of adversity, if you prioritize mind, what you think about something, this, this, this has application to every single day life. If you think first, we don't think first, we're led first. We sense first. We respond from here first. But see, here's the thing. This requires an order. This requires a pursuit. And ask the Spirit of God to minister to you specifically in your pursuits. But we know, and, and, and we'll, we'll, we'll take just moments um, to deviate and, and look at this. In Matthew chapter 6, 33, this is familiar to you. Seek first. That word seek actually means think. Think first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all of these things will be added unto you. This is a very familiar new covenant. Jesus read letters order for our pursuits. But if you look in the book of Haggai, the reality is God has been speaking to his people about this order since day one. Since day one. And man has been endeavoring to use their own order instead of simply surrendering to his order. Look at Haggai chapter one. And in my Bible, I have Matthew 6, 33 written above it. You may have been familiar with these, these verses, but in verse two, thus speaks the Lord of hosts saying, this people say the time is not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. Then came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet saying, is it time for you? to dwell in your sealed houses and this house lies in waste. Now, therefore, says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You've sown much and you bring in little. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but you're not filled with drink. You, you're clothed, but you're not warm. You earn wages, but it's as though those wages were put into bags with holes. Verse seven, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Go up to the mountain, bring the wood, and build the house. Pursue my kingdom. Take care of my house first. So this goes back to what's already been said. Who are we to say, God, I have some other things going on. This is what these people said. The time has not come to build the church, to build his house. The time's not come for that. I have other things going on. And God said, listen, here's the thing. In all your earning, you still don't have enough. In all your relationships, you're still not profiting. In all the ways that you're endeavoring to sustain yourself, you're still cold. And that that you try to accumulate with such effort, it's as though it all runs out. Why? Because there's no order. There's no order. You didn't order your days. Isn't that what David said? Teach me to order my days. If you can't order your day, then you won't have an orderly life. And so allow him to minister to you what needs to change. Where he isn't first, if he isn't first in your pursuits. Because this must be our order. Paul said, I keep my body under. It's way down here. What do I keep it under? I keep it under a spirit that surrendered to the father of spirits. And so therefore my soul is not in control. My soul, listen, if your soul does not surrender, and this is what we want, we want to, we want to encourage ourselves with as leaders, because Pastor Dean said this on Wednesday night, the Holy Spirit ministered to him. You can't make people, you can't convince people that this is the best life. You cannot convince people to serve Jesus with all of their heart. You cannot, but you should be able to convince yourself. <laughs> and only to the degree that you live this out, will you be an example for others to see. This order is really important. Let's look at this and, and, and then we'll, we'll go back. This is kind of a side note because this three, we're three parts. He is three parts, okay? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So, so when we look at our Father, and let me see exactly how I wrote it in my notes. So ultimately in creation, God planned 
Jesus spoke and the Holy Spirit did the work. There was an order. In our lives, in our relationship with God, God planned it, Jesus spoke it. In essence, he is the word, the spoken word, Jesus. And so when God said, in essence, Jesus was the one that was saying that and the Holy Spirit was hovering over the face of the deep, he was actually working it out, okay? What does that mean for our lives? That it is from the Spirit that we get the blueprint? This is why you can't spend all of your time researching and planning and thinking and asking everybody's opinion, okay? It's from the Spirit that we get the blueprint and then we demand of our soul that it begins to speak and think in line with the Word of God. And then ultimately, we tell our body what to do. Our body doesn't tell us what to do. Listen, you, you eat to live, you do not live to eat. You will move and function in the way with which you were created. You are not calling the shots. You will do as instructed because that's what the Holy Spirit did. Now in our relationship with Him, and again, this is an order, we're, we're kind of deviating, this is a side note, but ultimately, as it relates to our Father, in order to get that plan, we have to face Him. This is our worship. And as it relates to the Son, we're to follow Him. And then as it relates to our, our work with and through and by the Holy Spirit, we're to reveal Him. The things that people see in us shouldn't be us, but they should be spirit led us, so to speak. I only do, Jesus said, what I see my father do. I only say what I hear my father say. And so, so when we face him, then we can follow him, the son, the word, and then we will reveal all three of them in essence to the, to the lost and dying world around us. Now this order is important for us because in religion, what we would endeavor to do is follow him without first facing him. Just doing everything right. And that'll turn into a life of works. If you try to invert these two, facing him is, is and again, this isn't, this isn't just time on your knees, bowed before him. You know, so worship is so much more than that. It's just an acknowledgement. As simple as first thing in the morning where you say, God, have your way today in my life. You are worthy of my life. God, I don't want anything. I mean, when you, when you really think about your life, like, I don't, I don't want anything. I don't need anything. God, I'm here for you. And as long as, as you tarry your coming, God, I, I, I honor you with my life. The moments that I have, you know, maybe we'll, 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 we'll go here, we'll go there. But God, you're God. You're so worthy of it all. If I don't have you, I have nothing. I think that this is the simplicity of, of just facing him. I mean, cause you can't face him without humility. And humility means I die daily. That's what humility means. I die daily. I have no desire. I have no appetite. I have no agenda. What, what, what stands in, in his face? What stands in his face when you really look upon his face? When you really look upon this word and you see everything that he did for you, what's, what rivals that? A new what? Nothing rivals that. So when you face him first in that humility, there's this breaking loose. And so it, it just becomes automatic. Today, I'm gonna follow him. And as you follow him, as you just simply obey him, other people begin to notice that. And there's a, there's a spirit led demeanor. There's a spirit led power that begins to operate in and through you. Smith Wigglesworth, he said this, he said, I'm not moved by what I see. I'm not, you, you've probably heard brother Copeland quote it. You've probably heard brother Hagen quote it. Smith Wigglesworth said, I'm not moved by what I see. I'm not moved by what I feel. I'm moved only by what I believe. 
So we said last week, we feed our spirit. The Holy Spirit will teach you what is the main thing. The Spirit of God spoke this to my heart. He said, majoring on minors will steal your peace and time and weaken your faith. Majoring on minors will steal your peace and time and weaken your faith. Now, the thing about the minors is they still must be dealt with, but they don't need to be majored upon. Check the things that really frustrate you. Because when you're looking at him, you know, it puts all of that into perspective. Doesn't mean that the bills don't need to be paid, obviously. You know, doesn't mean that the dishes don't need to be washed. Doesn't mean that the house doesn't need to be clean. But we major on minors. And he said, it steals your peace and your time and it weakens your faith. And so ask him, I encourage you, let's ask him. Holy Spirit, show me the big deals today. I wanna focus all my efforts on the big deals, on the most important things. Show me as it relates to my boss and what's the most important for my company. Give me eyes that see and ears that hear. You know, one deal, just one deal, especially if you're in sales. You know, if you're out there in the, in the on, on location with the mind of Christ, one idea can revolutionize all of those operations. So Holy Spirit, show me, show me how to focus on the majors today and the minors will work themselves out. But I don't want my time stolen. I don't want my peace stolen. And I definitely don't want my faith weakened. So, so lastly, and let's look at this as it relates to our, our life of faith. Faith has three parts. It's believing, speaking, and doing. Do you see your ability to walk in faith is tied? They are three in one, but they are all three. It's not just what you know or an accumulation of knowledge. That's the blueprint. That's the plan. That happens in humility. I mean, when you really look at him, what really matters? What really matters? You look at him first thing in the morning. God, you are God and I am not. What else really matters? That puts it all into perspective. But this moves past just your believing into what you say. Brother Hagin said you could absolutely school yourself into faith as you just begin the bold declaration of what the word said is, says is true. Even if you haven't fully, you know, understood as it relates to, or maybe as we said, said uh, last week, you know, your mind may still be full of doubts, but out of your heart, you begin to boldly declare what the word is, what the word says is true, because it is true. And then we act as though it's so, that's our doing, which means why do you have a bad attitude? Why are you grumpy? Why are you complaining? Why do you have no strength? Proverbs 24, 10 says, if you faint in the day of adversity, many people don't faint in the day of adversity. From their perspective, every day's hard. There's not even any pressure as it would relate to like, what's wrong? Well, I don't know. Just You just, no joy, no spring in your step. So who's leading here? Is your body telling you it's tired? Oh, it rules now? Your mind is heavy with all kinds of things. What things? What things? Does the God of the universe indwell you by his spirit or not? What things? There's just so much going on. What? What's going on? We have more going for us than any other Christian in the history of Christianity. And we're weak in physical body. And we've got a lot going on. My friends, let's not let this be so. Lord, we love you and we thank you for your help. And not just what we've heard today, but that it would bring freedom and it would bring order and it would bring restraint into our lives. That when people would see us, God, that they would just see you. In Jesus' name, amen.